If music be the food of broadcasting, listen on to this episode on music on the BBC in the 1920s and the 1960s. But first, to bring us up to speed, previously on the British Broadcasting Century. It's late April 1923 and the last days of Marconi House, the BBC's first studios. The six-month-old auntie continues to grow and innovate. We've had a night of Shakespeare recently, a gala comedy concert sent via Harrods, daytime programming, government inquiries, new stations popping up in Glasgow and Cardiff. It's been a busy few months for the early Beeb. So with increasing demands on orchestra, quartets and singers across the land, the blossoming British Broadcasting Company needs somebody in charge of all of this tune-making. Ideally somebody who knows their arn from their elbow. This time, music. Yes, a key appointment is made, so we are using the hiring of Percy Pitt as a jumping-off point to look at later decades of music on the BBC. So we'll tell you the tale of Percy Pitt, that music advisor who joined in late April 1923, but we'll also hear from ex-Radio 1 chief Johnny Beerling. He also produced the first Radio 1 show in 1967, and we chatted for quite a while. So, anecdotes await you. This episode, Johnny Beerling tells us about the 50s and 60s. He'll return in a future episode to tell us about running Radio 1 from the 1980s. Plus, BBC producer Alec Reid brings us tales of how the BBC helped boost an up-and-coming rock band who would go on to become super famous. And where was he for the moon landing? Hmm, Playing a key role. But back to music, we'll also look at what was the first music on the BBC, which has been rather tricky to say for, well, nearly a century. But we will have the answers this episode. The first music on the Beeb. It's quite a show, all themed on music, so count me in. And can we count you in? Go on then, it's episode 74 of the British Broadcasting Century. A one, two, three, four. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us again on this bit-by-bit origin story of the nation's favourite. Ah, the world's favourite. Perhaps. I'm Paul Carenza, and before we embark on music, a quick look back at comedy from the previous episode. Uh, Particularly, I wanted to throw some golden info your way about Captain Ian Fraser. Now, if you've heard the last episode, you may recall that we told you about uh, Ian Fraser. He was this sightless serviceman who, in 1921, ran pretty much the only broadcast that entire year. It was London's first broadcast as well, a fundraiser for St Dunstan's, his hostel for fellow blinded soldiers. Well, after publishing that episode, I fancy putting Captain Fraser's tale into the novel that I'm writing, Auntie and Uncles, The Bizarre Birth of the BBC, out soon when I've finished it. So I did a bit more digging on Captain Ian Fraser. What biographical joy I found about him. So a little update to add to last episode. Captain Fraser did not just run the first London broadcast. He has another link with the BBC. He became a BBC governor in 1936 after becoming an MP. But that's not the cool thing. Nor is the cool thing that he became the first life peer in 1958, or that his dad helped found Johannesburg, or that Ian Fraser married the woman who delivered the letter asking him to run St Dunstan's Hostel for the Blind. No, the very cool thing about Captain Ian Fraser is that he invented the audiobook. What? Yes, I know. 1918, two years after that German bullet stole his sight in the Battle of the Somme. Captain Ian Fraser is running St Dunstan's, where they rehabilitate soldiers. They teach them how to touch type or row, uh, make music, work and play. And Captain Fraser is learning Braille, but he hates it. One day, in exasperation, he exclaims, If books could only talk! He had an idea. He'd been listening to gramophone records of music. Why not a talking book? And so in 1918, with the help of the RNIB, Captain Fraser recorded some favourite poems and released them via Columbia and Pathéphone records. The first beginnings of the talking book, said Captain Fraser. And that's why then he was drawn to this pre-BBC fundraising broadcast with the Marconi Company, summer of 1921, with the co-optimists that we told you all about last time, using tech to reach those in need, who, like him, couldn't see, but they could listen. So next time you're listening to an audiobook or a podcast like this one, doff your cap to Captain Ian Fraser. So that's an additional bit to go with the previous episode. As for what's coming up on this one, uh, and indeed future ones, well, here's the plan. The podcasts uh, will continue, but I'm going to put one of those sort of arbitrary series breaks in 
very soon. We've told the tale of the first few months of 1923. I think we need that little kind of imaginary line in the sand, so to speak. Season six, then, will tell of the closing of Marconi House, the opening of Savoy Hill, May the 1st, 1923. We're actually going to recreate the legendary opening night. Some cracking tales about that. You've got the next day after that, the first women's hour. Dr. Kate Murphy will tell us all about that. Then we'll have the first full-length Shakespeare with Dr. Andrea Smith. We talk about comedian John Henry with Alan Stafford. We've got the first sports report, the ongoing Sykes Inquiry, the start of gardening, drama criticism, international broadcast. Trust me, there are many, many, many brilliant tales to tell coming up on the podcast oh and before we get to season six i should say we're going to have a special on the centenary of the radio times yes happy hundredth birthday to everyone's favorite listings mag but this time music as well as a little on percy pitt and the expanding bbc music department going into savoy hill got a marvelous guest or two one of the most influential people in bbc history with regard to music radio we chatted for so long at his home that I think we should start with him. So please be upstanding for former head of Radio 1, producer of the first Radio 1 show right back in 1967. Before we journey back to 1923, let's get underway with Johnny Beerling. 1957 was when I joined the BBC. Two years before that, did national service as we had to in those days, back in 1955. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, but... <laughs> That didn't happen, and they said, what else would you like to do? And I said, well, my dad was always interested in radio, so I'd like to learn about radio. Okay, we'll teach you to be a a wireless fitter. (laughs) So I was sent down to Compton Bassett in Wiltshire, where I spent the best part of a year being trained, and I finished up as 2768410 Junior Technician Beerling J, and a wireless fitter. And I was posted to Aden. This was just coming up to the time of Suez the Suez Crisis, and uh, there was a radio station in Aden, the Aden Forces Broadcasting Association, and they said, you know, you'll be the studio technician, but you have to get up at five o'clock every morning and broadcast to the troops for two hours of morning music. <laughs> I fancied myself as a budding Pete Murray or David Jacobs. They were the sort of star DJs in, in those days. And I had to sort of wake up the, the colony from six till eight, then from 8 o'clock till 8.30, we relayed the general overseas service of the BBC, the news programme. And then we, the climate was so hot in Aden that the station shut down at uh, 8.30 and stayed closed until 5 o'clock in the evening. So that was that was my start of broadcasting, and I enjoyed it so much that uh, I was visited one day by a man, marvellous job. He was sort of checking on the reception of the BBC overseas I had a chat with him and said, really, I'd like to join the BBC. And I was so naive. I joined as a technical operator because I thought that was working in studios and being next to the actual broadcasters. I found out afterwards the people who did that were called studio managers and they were all frightfully arty. It was a very different organisation, very labour intensive. I mean, the, the act of producing a programme like Housewives Choice would probably illustrate that best in the sense that how it worked was like this all the postcards would come in to the bbc and then you would be given a bunch of them and you sorted through them as the producer to find out the records that you wanted and you tried to produce a, a balanced mix of musical items jazz items popular music and so on and housewife's choice went from nine till nine fifty five so once you'd sorted out the postcards for whose requests you were going to play you would then go and look out those records and you'd meet the celebrity that was going to be presented. And he took away the postcards and hand-wrote, in longhand, the the script. That would then come back into the BBC and be typed up. In the meantime, the producer would go to the library and look up those 14 or 15 records that made up the hour and look them up and order them from the library, where they'd be delivered to your office. Then you'd play each one through to check for quality and duration. And then the script would be typed up in the meantime. And then on the day of transmission, you would meet up about six o'clock in the morning, and do a full real-time rehearsal when all the records were played, everything was timed. Each little link was produced like a talk. You know, right. you, it's just we want to make cuts for duration and get it right. And then having rehearsed the whole thing through, there'd be a half-hour break before the transmission, and you would have a breakfast of croissants and orange juice and coffee and what have you. Very nice. <laughs> and then you would go on the air, nine o'clock, housewife's choice. George Ellerick was one of the personalities. He always sang along with the signature. <laughs> I'll be with you all again tomorrow morning. 
This is Mrs. Elric's wee son George, and uh, that was him doing the, the closing. Anyway, it went on from 9 till 9.55, when it was followed by five minutes of religious broadcasting, a story, a hymn, and a prayer, 5 to 10. So that was that was it, and then you would, having done all that, you'd start the same thing all over again the next day, and do this every day for five days. And that would be your production of Housewife's Choice. And of course, in the, in the studio side, there was one person, one junior studio manager to play the records, another one to mix the sound. The presenter would sit in a glass box, looking through the window and reading his script. And then there would be a producer overall timing. So four people to produce an hour's record program, oh, yes, <laughs> you know, which is very different much later when Radio 1 started. But it was a, a very laborious process in those days. And then when you come to the actual topic of recording programs, only long-form programs like Half Hour Long would be on tape. Short-form things like news reports coming in from foreign correspondents, they will be cut on acetate discs at 78 RPM. And the studio manager had to play them in. If you were doing a programme like Radio Newsreel, which perhaps had a, eight or ten inserts in it, or from foreign correspondence, you had to record them all. And you'd take a yellow china graph pencil and actually make a, a mark on the disc just before where you wanted to start. You'd have to queue it up. You were very skilled. The technical operators that were, or studio managers that were playing those discs in. I wonder we all smoked a lot of cigarettes in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Would you describe it 1957 to 1967 as a sign of an era? Because 1967 things change. Yes they did. I mean the influence of pirate radio was such that I'm one of the only, I think probably the only person from the BBC that went out to see the pirate ships. I told my boss I wanted to go and have a look and he said I'd rather not know about that. <laughs> really? <laughs> I managed to wangle a trip out with some people and we went from Harwich on a tender out to the Galaxy, which was the home of Radio London. I met people like Tony Blackburn, Keith Skews, Kenny Everett. Even John Peel was there, I think, at the time. What amazed me when I saw it was that everything was what we call self-operation, self-op, as it is now in local radio, as you know. But in those days, they would play their own records, mix the microphone and the guest microphone if they were having guests to be interviewed, play in the jingles and do the whole thing. It was no producer, it was just a one-man operation, very different from the four-man operation at the BBC. So, of course, one of the big problems once um, Radio 1 was set up, there was nowhere in the BBC where people could play their own records, except in the continuity studios, where announcers had the ability to play a record in the event of an awful breakdown or something. You know, So we had to modify continuity studios and design them so that they could do this self op self operation. It was a very different sort of world. So you got out to you had your field trip to the pirate, the actual ship itself then and these yes. come back and brought uh well oh, gradually brought some people with you then I suppose. Well yeah, I didn't go out there on a recruiting drive. I mean it's been reported that I did, but I just I was just interested to see as a fan of pirate radio and I was a young man in those days. So I wanted to see how it was done and what was different. And of course it was the way it had been done in America and the whole concept had been brought over by American backers, particularly, I mean, Radio London, which I thought was one of the best of the pirates, was based on WABC, which was the top 40 station in New York at the time. I was always very keen on popular music and big band music, which of course is I'm still doing today with Serenade Radio 65 years later. More from Johnny shortly. We'll pick up the tale with the launch of Radio 1 and a tale of later BBC musical influence from ex-studio manager Alec Reid, all on the way. But our primary location on this podcast is in the 1920s. Right now that's 1923 and April. It's the last days of Marconi House amid great preparation for the BBC move just down the road to Savoy Hill. It's right next to the Savoy Hotel and that means the Beeb used their dance bands. You've got the Savoy Orpheans, the Savoy Havana Band, both hugely popular at the time and now brought to the nation's homes via the new wireless. Yes, wireless was for news and talks and children's programmes, but if it could rival the piano there in people's homes for some musical entertainment, especially post-war when people wanted peace and joy and harmony, well then listeners in would be cutting the rug in homes across the land. When I say cutting the rug I don't mean trimming a wig, I mean literally dancing on their living room carpets to music on the radio. Right. 
So the time was right for the expansion of the BBC Music programme, especially with eight stations to feed. The laundry basket of sheet music and gramophone records was passed around the land, along with visiting artists. Stanton Jeffries was musical director in the first few months, playing piano most nights on London 200, while inventing this whole new technique of orchestra placement, putting certain players in certain places so that the overall effect was of music reaching the microphone all at just the right level. Balance and control, it was called. There I sat while engineers tested microphones, a typist clicked away morning, noon and night, and streams of artists poured in begging for engagements. I say, Mr Jeffries, there's a gentleman here who says he wants to give a lecture to the listeners in on how to catch a tiger. On what? How to catch a tiger. Well, it's an idea. Here, give me the phone. Hello, sir. Well, we shall have to consider the idea. You see, we haven't given any lectures so far. No, our transmissions are musical items entirely. Not at all, sir. It's a pleasure. Goodbye. Uh, Mr Jeffries, I think you wanted us to test out a microphone on some bells. Bells? Oh, yes. I've got some tubular bells here. You see, the idea is to give listeners in a time signal. Now, tonight at ten, I'm going to play the Westminster chimes. Like this. Stanton Jeffries and company there, recreating his early days at the BBC. Do you think you would rig up a mic to transmit that? On Leslie yes, Bailey's programme, sir. Scrapbook for 1922. He would soon move to a more technical role, overseeing how the broadcasts actually sounded. And someone else was required then to advise and oversee what music was broadcast and how. So, hired on the 30th of April 1923, ready to start work at Savoy Hill the next day, let's meet Percy Pitt. Ah, here is Percy Pitt conducting the BBC Wireless Symphony Orchestra in 1925, two years into his tenure at the Beeb. Rossini's Semiramide there. The pronunciation is questionable. Percy Pitt was actually a composer as well. He is a veteran of Queen's Hall. Pitt was the first accompanist for Henry Wood's proms in 1897, long before the BBC took over, long before wireless telephony was even a possibility. One review noted, His conducting methods were a trifle peculiar. He had a habit of burying his head in the score and waving his arms over his head like a gesticulating stag beetle. Percy Pitt became music director at Covent Garden's Royal Opera House in 1907 and then directed the British National Opera Company in 1920. And as you may recall, the British National Opera Company were the people involved in those very first outside broadcasts in early 1923. So that's where the BBC found him. At this point, he's aged 54. He's one of the older people involved in the BBC at this point, which is really a young man's game. It's mostly young men in their 20s and 30s, including Cecil Lewis, young Spitfire ace in his 20s. Uh, John Reith is in his 30s, so yeah, Percy Pitt is on the older side, but he has experience. This is from the London Daily News, 30th of April 1923. Mr Percy Pitt has been appointed musical director by the British Broadcasting Company, who in view of the theatrical trade's ban on broadcasting are forming companies of their own, will broadcast operatic performances from their own theatre, now nearing completion at Savoy Hill. Very soon after joining in May 1923, Percy Pitt was heading up the 2LO Dance Band from late May, uh, then the 2LO Military band, the Tuolo Light Orchestra, the Tuolo Octet as well, all of this under his jurisdiction. The companies will not only give performances at the London station, but will be sent on tour to the provincial stations. The idea that broadcasting shows will jeopardise their success has never entered the American manager's heads, said Mr Ewood H. Robbins, the leading American actor in So This Is London. They find wireless not a bogey, but a magnet to the box office, and seeing it a potent weapon in their fight against the cinema. His job at the Beeb kept on shifting around the newly formed music department. He was music advisor at first, then music controller. That newspaper article called him musical director. He was later director of music from November 1924, taking over from Stanton Jeffries. But where Stanton Jeffries' role seems to be more linked with early music selection and auditioning artists and accompanying them on the piano almost nightly, Percy Pitt seemed to go bigger. Within weeks, Pitt got a symphony concert on the air on the 21st of June with an augmented BBC orchestra, so says Asa Briggs, the historian. Five months after that, the size and scope was growing. Forty musicians broadcast a Wagner concert, a huge undertaking compared with the trios and quartets of the earliest broadcasts. So Percy Pitt's BBC career spanned Savoy Hill. He arrived the day before it opened. He left a year or two before it closed. In fact, Percy Pitt died just after Broadcasting House was opened in 1932. 
as director of music from late 1924. Percy Pitt merged the BBC's orchestra with the Covent Garden Orchestra, and that helped entice world-renowned composers and conductors to direct them. Edward Elgar, Richard Strauss, George Gershwin with his Rhapsody in Blue. He gave the first British performance live on the BBC with the Savoy Orpheans, Gershwin himself on piano. May 1928, you get Bach's cantatas each Sunday on the BBC. In the church cantatas of Bach, there exists a superb treasure of music which is practically unknown to the English public. Uh, Introducing it, he's a fascinating man we'll meet on a future episode. Mr Filson Young. It is our intention, Sunday by Sunday, to present these cantatas. This is a costly service, and the BBC is the only organisation which could possibly... Well, Bach's cantatas were ambitious and not popular with everybody. Apparently one violinist reached Charing Cross soon before he was due on the air and he held a taxi. Savoy Hill, quickly. The cabbie saw his violin case and noted the BBC address. You a musician? Yes. You playing in them cantatas? Yes, I am. Walk. Let's flash forward four decades and join producer, later station director, now broadcaster on Serenade Radio, Johnny Beerling. And he told me all about what it was like launching Radio 1. I'd worked as a studio manager for five or six years on various popular music programmes. I'd become friendly with producers like Derek Chinnery and Teddy Warwick, Pat Osborne and those people. And they suggested I applied for a production vacancy, which I was lucky enough to get. I think the first thing I ever produced was uh, Music from the Continent. I know that was half an hour, half past six till seven on the BBC Home Service. Zither music, and it was all non copyright stuff that was out of the recorded program library. They'd commissioned a man called Gerard Mansell to write a report on the future of the BBC or BBC Radio, and he came out with this report called Broadcasting in the 70s, where he suggested running radio on a generic basis so Radio 1 would be popular and light music. And they asked me if I'd like to produce the first ever program. I didn't realize how historic. That was at the time. It's only really come to Tony and me looking back on it that we can see what a major thing it was, the BBC launching four brand new networks as opposed to the three national networks, the Home Light and the Third, which had been there before. I'd got to know Tony Blackburn. Several of them had come ashore, like Simon D, Tony Blackburn. They came ashore because they saw the writing on the wall. that They brought in the Marine Offences Act, which was making it illegal to service the, the ships. So it was very difficult for them to continue. So Tony had cleverly come ashore six months before Radio 1 started, at least. And I had got to know him doing the breakfast show for the first six months. But I was living down in Kent in those days, and after a couple of weeks of getting up in the middle of the night and driving up to town, I realised Tony didn't need a producer sitting there in the studio. I said, I'll listen to it at home and then come to work, and then we can discuss the next day's programme or what have you, and that worked quite well. What was the first music on the BBC? We will answer that question in just a few minutes' time. But first, Johnny Beeling has brought us to the late 1960s. Soon after that, a certain band had a certain brush with the Beeb. Let's meet another guest then to talk us through it. He was there, and I spoke far too long ago. I can only apologise for that. With author and former BBC studio manager, veteran of the BBC for a third of its existence. Here is a tale from Alec Reid. What happened was, I was, as you said, a studio manager. I'd been a studio manager long enough to start thinking, well, maybe I could do some other things as well. I applied what they call an attachment in the BBC, where they loan you out to a, another department, usually on a more senior pay grade, A, to see if you can hack it, and B, to give you some eligibility for applying for an equivalent job should one crop up. And I applied for a department called Sound Archives Production Unit, as it then was, run by a guy called Harry Rogers, and got turned down, but uh, then got phoned up later saying, you know, go take that per- personally, we'd like you to reapply in a year's time. In the intervening year, I went to television presentation and uh, my main claim to fame there was was sitting in the international control room for 24 hours, didn't leave the chair for 24 hours, uh, relaying the pictures of the first moonwalk around Europe as they came in. Oh, wow. Um, interestingly enough, the sound and video arrived out of sync. Um, the pictures arrived before the sound did. Oh, right. At the time I had to get up and put my hand on a tape recorder, which was 
recording the thing and sort of adjust uh, so that they go more or less in sync again and then sit down. <laughs> so you've got to fix that before we then see it, I suppose, and and, and get it all out there so that we, we see as pure a picture as possible, which is going to be tricky well, when well, it's just coming that, out. That, 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 that was it, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my my body memory of that, apart from obviously the, the actual moonwalk, was a monitor that was showing uh, the astronomer Patrick Moore waiting to leap in at any any given moment when requested to pontificate about what was going on. You just don't know when the information's going to come, when yeah. the moonwalk's going to happen. It could be minutes, could be hours, could be days, I suppose. To well, that. well, that's why I was sitting there for 24 hours. I, I don't know how long we waited. Extraordinary way of doing things. I mean, I had no background or training in any of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, well, can you just go in there and do that? And I was supposed to have been relieved after, you know, four hours or six hours or whatever. It's an all-night shift, but everybody else was sitting in the office glued to the screen and wouldn't come and read me. Oh, no, I bet. I presume there was no script that said, at this point, Neil Armstrong will say one small step for man. No, no I, 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 I learned all that at the same time as everybody else did. You know. So, but anyway, that, that yes. I, I think I was in television presentation initially for six months, but towards the end of that time, they then re-advertised attachment to Sound Archives production unit. And, and I got it that time. My task was to produce two editions of the Night Ride programme, which went out on radios one and two between midnight and 2am, you know, sort of peak listening, really. Um, I had, had been a studio manager for five years and, you, you know, was comfortable with all that. And I mixed bands. And when I was studio managing, I, I was went into the BBC's gramophone library, it was then called, where every single record that was issued in the UK, the BBC automatically bought a copy. So it was the biggest commercial record library, if you like. It was a day or two after I'd written a, a scurrilous lyric to the tune of Sing a Song of Sixpence about um, Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> well, who hasn't owned their time? Yeah, well, yeah. well, the thing was, I was working on whatever the precursor to the world that one was. I can't remember. It was a one-hour news programme anyway on Radio 4. You know, I was playing in tapes from correspondence and things like that. And there was a story about Mary Whitehouse, whose father amused me. So I wrote this lyric and a fellow studio manager sang it for me you know, at the piano. Uh, and so I took the tape into to the, pro the programme and I think they were all set to um, broadcast it. But then I, I think the yes, they got a little bit wary of, of the line, her public condemnations publicise her books. Um, which I thought was potentially libelous. Well, so that never happened. Okay. Anyway, in the gramophone library, I met this guy called Tony Smith, who was one of the clerks there. And I told him this story. And he said, well, I'm a um, singer-songwriter, um, but I've got no way of recording anything. So I put him in the studio, and he was indeed really excellent. Uh, I got to know him better because he wanted to form a vocal group, and I introduced him to the girl who singing high soprano and that's all worked out formed a group called design and as i got to know him better he was saying that he'd been a pupil at charterhouse school mm. and he'd been impressed by some slightly younger pupils there um, who had a band called genesis ah. could i go and record them as well so i only have the vaguest memory of it but i seem to remember standing in a barn with a revox tape recorder recording these lads then sometime later on probably about six months before I went to Night Ride. He phoned me up and said, could I come down and engineer a couple of tracks at Regent Sound Studios in Denmark Street in London? Because they wanted to record four songs for some other demos or something. Mm. So it was an all-night session, and we recorded the four songs. I, I engineered two of them. I think they used them to try and get a record deal, which they didn't get. That was that. But then I got the Night Ride gig. I was in a position to book musicians, you, you know, so the first booking I did was design. And a month or two later, I booked Genesis and turned up in studio and BBC's Made of Ale Studios. And I had to explain that the, the equipment in sound studios at the BBC at the, the time was state of the art in about 1943. <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of it was actually designed then. And of course, they built it to last. So the damn thing was still last. <laughs> the faders were circular, what they call pots, potentiometers. You may have had access to a couple of tone controls, you know, equalizers, mm -hmm. um, which you could sort of hook to 
you know, the two channels and you, you, you had an echo send and there would be an echo chamber somewhere in the building. Uh, and I think maybe a compressor or two, but that was it. Mm. But by that time, you know, commercial studios were recording in stereo routinely, had eight track at least. When bands came into the BBC, I hope they wonder what they came, came into. But um, the studio managers and producers there were very gifted at squeezing the maximum. And, and a lot of the bands went away very pleased with what they were getting, albeit mono. What year is this then we're talking about? This uh, 69, 69. 69, right. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. The, the actual Genesis session and broadcast took place in, in February 70. But the great thing is I've just discovered the tape at home. Ah. Um, I have a first generation copy from the master tape of the original night ride session as well wow I, I, I mean somewhere in the 1990s um somebody from genesis got in touch with me and asked if they could borrow it because they wanted to you know they're putting together a compilation set of cds so i lent it to them and they gave it back they presumably had the master tape of the regent sound session so anyway got to the session they all duly turned up and, and i think made a veil four with the potentiometers and off we went but in the middle of one of the numbers, Pete Gabriel, who at that time was with Genesis and singing lead vocal, looked towards the control room window. Uh, and of course, there are always a few girls in, in the control room. Pete said, can, can any of the girls in there hold a tune? And there was silence. And then Ella, who was my girlfriend at the time, and you, you know, who's now my wife, um, said, well, I can. I said, well, can you come in here then? And so she found herself singing harmonies with Genesis on their first broadcast. Wow. I remember playing the tape to someone from United Artists who came to see me, you, you know, talk about some musical thing or other. And he, he thought they were absolutely fantastic. But they did get a record deal very quickly after that. One session that I did do, I don't know if you know the names, Ken Howard and Alan Blakely, who were songwriters and composers. And they had written a rock opera called Ark 2. The rock opera contained one song which had the immortal couplets, if you dirty, rotten bastards threaten now way of life, we're going to grab you by the balls, um, <laughs> which I thought was wonderfully sensitive. I just put it out. It was one o'clock in the morning. You know, the audience was mainly students and long distance lorry drivers, and I didn't think there would be much resistance there. A few days later, Harry Rogers, whom I mentioned, who ran the Sand Archives production unit, came to see me and said, I've received a complaint from the Director General's office. And I thought, oh, this is Here we are. something I may have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's a letter from this colonel or somebody who was listening to it with his stenographer, shorthand typist, I suppose. You know, he was very embarrassed for her. And, and I remember saying, well, I don't think the young lady would be particularly offended by that. But I, I do wonder what this colonel was doing with his shorthand typist at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 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 uh, just the same response from Harry Rogers, and I never heard any more of it. Oh, well, there you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the final <laughs> upshot was the drummer on that session was Phil Collins, mm -hmm. who a year later joined Genesis. So the, there was a Genesis connection there. Bill Aitken's book has the thesis that most of those mega bands probably wouldn't have had the career they had without early championship from the BBC and those early sessions. Alec Reed, there, former BBC studio manager, now writer. His audiobook of his short stories is on Audible. If you search for For Her Bones, Dark Tales, ooh, yes, you will find ghost stories, ahoy, from that former studio manager. Thank you, Alec. Before we return to Johnny Beerling with more on Radio One and its music, let's go back to the very start. Because if we're talking of Genesis, let's go to the Genesis of the BBC and ask what was the first song? on the British Broadcasting Company. I don't think this question has ever been asked before, or at least not answered, not properly, or at least not accurately. But I've worked it out for you. So this is November 1922. Discovering the BBC's first music is not quite as easy as you would think. If you check the official BBC records and history books, you often see Drake, the, sorry, not the Canadian R&B hip-hop artiste. No, Drake Goes West sung by Leonard Hawke. Drake is going west, lad. Here's a ship out in the bay. See, this was the first song on the first BBC London concert, day three of the BBC, because day one was nothing but news, even though London Tour Low had given dozens of concerts the months before, but when it became under the BBC's tenure, it began with news. Day three, then, was the first London concert with this, its first song. 
But that's just another case of London writing the history books, because the day before that, November 15th, 1922, day two of the Beeb, Manchester and Birmingham joined the airwaves, and they both brought music with them. So which was first, Birmingham or Manchester? What was the first music of the BBC? Well, a quick glance at the station director's notebooks tells me Manchester 2ZY opened for its first BBC broadcast with Chrysler's Liebes Lied. That means love sorrow. Birmingham 5IT opened the same day with something I can barely decipher thanks to the handwriting of Percy Edgar. I put this to Facebook. I shared not the notebook because I'm not allowed to for rights reasons, but I traced his handwriting and I shared my impression of his handwriting. And we on Facebook concluded that it says Tower Scene. It definitely says Il Trovatore by Verdi, and it definitely says Miss Florence Winkless and Mr. Arthur Gilbert. So I then asked around some classical aficionados, and we reckon a duet in the tower scene must be a piece called Miserere. So this is the first music from the Birmingham station by Verdi. Now these, of course, are gramophone records, not by the original artists, but this is as near as we can get to what it would have sounded like to, for the first time, hear music on the BBC, November 1922. But this isn't enough of the podcast, is it? I want to know which was first. Well, Manchester started at 5pm. So, Chrysler's Liebes Lied was technically the first piece of music on the BBC, because Birmingham started 20 minutes later. Auntie's first music. Then they played Old Viennese Melody, and after the News and Kiddies Corner, they had Roger Quilter's Children's Overture. Then 14 more songs, including Grieg Sonata in C minor, Land of Hope and Glory, The Swanee Waltz, and one of my favourites, Intermezzo, Cavaliera, Rusticana, closing at 9.40 on that first musical night. But here's another thing. Manchester favoured gramophone recordings. In fact, Arthur Burroughs in London had a go at them for their reliance on the discs. It was seen as cheating at the time. Now, of course, we take recorded music for granted, but back then people wanted to hear live music more than anything else. So although it was 20 minutes later, the BBC's first live music was Birmingham's burst of Il Trovatore. That was followed by part one of Act One from Madame Butterfly. Beatrice Best singing The Blind Ploughman. There's a favourite of Arthur Burroughs there. Walter Hurd sang Andante. Madge Smith sang the Scottish song Annie Laurie, another favourite of Arthur Burroughs, which makes me think that he planned this playlist from London. They had 15 songs in total from Birmingham on November the 15th. That was a whole day before London with the oft-reported non-first song of the BBC, Drake Goes West. So I reckon Drake goes down to number 32-ish in terms of when it was played on the Beeb. We could, of course, go back further. The first piece of music on regular British broadcasting, pre-BBC, nine months before that, 2MT Riddle, of course, played the floral dance, sung by Robert Howe. Now, the first live music broadcast two years before that, February 1920, was Absent by Winifred Sayer. These aren't the original singers, but they are the songs, and as near a recording as we have. The first music on any radio broadcast in the world, probably Reginald Fessenden's violin rendition of Oh Holy Night. Christmas Eve 1906. But that's going back a little far, isn't it? So six decades later, what was radio like for Johnny Beerling? The programme called Where It's At, which was a, a Saturday afternoon show, very much modelled on the pirates. We didn't have any jingles in those days, we made our own by cutting the beginnings and ends of big bands together and use the voice of a dark brown voice of a man Canadian called Duncan Johnson sadly no longer with us so you're listening to Where It's At on the BBC Light Programme Thank you to Where It's At for the best in sound <laughs> Sounds very naff now but it was, it was fun in those days and of course a few years later I was lucky enough to make the acquaintanceship of John Woolford. Well, my original jingles were done by a company called Pam's Production, Promotions and Merchandisers in Dallas. Dallas became the sort of capital of jingle making because it was a right to work state and you could do a buyout. You didn't have to pay copyright every time you played. Can you imagine that in those days the BBC had to pay for every minute of needle time that you used so he, uh, a secretary would always be charged with writing the PSB, because the programme has broadcast, and reporting every second of every record that were played. We thought we can't play jingles and have to do that, so we, we went to America and Pams were recognised as one of the best jingle makers. Well, that was run by a man called Bill Meeks, and eventually his company went under. 
and John Wolford, who had worked for him, started Jam, which was John and Mary Lynn, his initials of him and his wife, and they started, and they made jingles very much in the same style as Pam's. And he got the contract with Radio 1, which lasted for 17 years. And he and I are still good friends now. Johnny Beerling will return with tales of the 1980s, running Radio 1, the Radio 1 Roadshow, and Live Aid, and a future episode of the British Broadcasting Century podcast. As ever with our long chats, I've held a few bits back from our conversation, so do stay subscribed, and in future episodes we will get to the rest of Mr Beerling when we can. Thank you too to Alec Reed for his interview and his patience, because I've had that recording a long time. I've recorded loads of interviews about a year and a bit ago. It's taken this long to try and get them all out, and we've got more to come yet, so do subscribe, tell your friends, tell your enemies, as long as your enemies have a podcast app, they are very welcome here. Now, I know that we've not dwelt quite as much in 1923, this episode. I instead have used Percy Pitt's hiring as a jumping off point into later and indeed earlier music on the BBC. But Percy Pitt joined on April the 30th, 23. That means we are now about to move on to May 1923, a new era, and that will be season six of the British Broadcasting Century podcast. Stay with us for the speeches, the drunken lord, the backstage gossip, and the BBC staff play a fun game of hide the booze from John Reith as Savoy Hill opens. That is a true story and an amazing one. But first, next episode, as I record this, the Radio Times is about to turn 100. So we will leap ahead in our timeline just a few months to September the 28th, 1923 for a special on a century of our favourite listings mag. Created by Wreath, still with us today, and still right by my armchair as I watch TV, and I'm sure by yours too. Did you know, in fact, we were Radio Times Podcast of the Month a few months ago? Yes, indeed. Well, I can't wait to return the favour next episode. We'll be interviewing its editor, Shem Law, live at Radio Times headquarters. Very excited about that. Also chatting to Radio Times collector Steve Arnold and the first editor's grandson, Justin Webb. What an episode. Subscribe. And it will be yours next time. Thank you to Johnny Beerling, Alec Reed, and you for listening. And do share if you like this, because... The British Broadcasting Century is a solo-operated podcast. It's just run by little old Paul Carenza, with original music by Will Farmer. With nothing to do with the BBC whatsoever, and all broadcasts of this vintage are pretty much out of copyright. Although some rights may reside with players or writers or their families, so if that's you and you have issues with us, do drop me a line. The joy of podcasting is we can edit and edit out. It's all one giant work in progress to inform, educate and entertain. And thanks as ever to our Patreon supporters keeping this afloat. Do join them. Patreon.com slash Paul Carenza for videos and writings and bonus bits and things. A fiver a month. Join for a bit. Cancel when you like. But know this. Without our Patreon subscribers, there is no podcast. So we thank you so much for your support. Join us next time. Yellow highlighters at the ready for the Radio Times Centenary here on the British Broadcasting Century. <laughs> <laughs>